Good evening, everybody. Good evening. That's better. Um, my name is Stephen Shute. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of uh, Sussex. And thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening to hear from two exceptional University of Sussex alumni whose work in tackling poverty, health, and education issues has recently been recognised in a global, highly prestigious competition run by the British Council. In the room, and also those joining us uh, via the Facebook live, live stream, is a warm community of Sussex and IDS students, staff and alumni. Welcome to you all. As Pro Vice-Chancellor at the University of Sussex, I've been closely involved in helping to develop the university's vision for the future, a better university for a better world. For Sussex 2025, which is the framework within which that vision is set, we're building on the original foundations of disruption, distinction, and interdisciplinarity to realize a modern, progressive university for a new age and a new scale. We now have almost 20,000 students currently studying at the University of Sussex. From our founding academics who tore up the established practices and set about reinventing, as our um, founder, one of our founders, Asa Briggs, put it, the map of learning, blending science with the social sciences and arts, to students who campaigned for causes they passionately believed in. The University of Sussex and its graduates have been at the forefront of societal and scientific progress. The Institute of Development Studies, also established on our campus in the 1960s, is a global research and learning organization with a vision for equitable and sustainable change. This year, they're welcoming nearly 300 new students from 60 countries across the world to their master's degrees in international development. And as many of you will know, the University of Sussex, together with IDS and the courses that we run in development studies, are ranked in the QS World Rankings as number one in the world. And we've been number one for about three years now. Uh, we um, leapfrogged over, I'm pleased to say, Harvard about three years ago, and those imposters have been kept in their place. <laughs> in Sussex 2025, we talk about the values at the heart of the university, and there are five of them that we've identified. Kindness integrity, inclusion, collaboration, and courage. Those are five values that we look to live out in everything that we do. And I couldn't ask for a better set of examples of people who embody those values than Rajan and Manamur, who have taken on huge challenges to create better and more sustainable ways of living and working for thousands of people in South Africa and in Bangladesh, respectively. So we're really proud to welcome them back on campus to share their extraordinary stories with you tonight. And it makes me personally proud to work for the University of Sussex to have such inspiring people coming back to talk to us uh, who have graduated uh, through this university. Their visit has been made possible by the fact that they've both won the Global Study UK Alumni Award this year for their initiatives and the impact that they have made. And that's no small feat because more than 1,200 applications were received for the three 2019 <coughs> Alumni Awards. And they came from people in more than 100 countries, and they represented 120 UK universities. These prestigious global awards are delivered by the British Council, the UK's international organisation for cultural relations and educational opportunities. And I 
thank the British Council for setting up this award scheme and making things possible that otherwise would not have been. The awards celebrate the outstanding achievements of the UK's international alumni around the world, raising their profile and that of their former UK universities at a global level. I quote from what the British Council says about these awards. Award winners and finalists are leaders in their field who have used their experience of studying at a UK university to make an impact in their communities, industries, and countries. And I just wanted, before I hand over to our next speaker, to recount what it meant to me meeting them personally this afternoon, talking uh, through their projects and understanding them better uh, as people. Two more warm and uh, exciting and innovative thinkers, it's hard to imagine. And I know that you will take forward the relationship uh, that you've had with the University of Sussex and with IBS over the next few years too. So now to Dr. Julie Litchfield, who's going to introduce our first speaker, Rajani Woodroff. And uh, Rajani was one of Julie's students. She taught her, so it's an especially poignant moment for her. I hope you enjoy the evening. My warm congratulations once again to the two award winners. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you, Stephen. Um, my name is Julie Litchfield. Uh, I'm from the economics department. And yes, I have indeed had the privilege of uh, teaching one of the award winners today. I think I'm sure faculty teachers in the audience will share with me this feeling of pride we have when we hear of any success of our students. Uh, we celebrate everything that our students are able to achieve, even if it is just turning up for a lecture on time or handing in some homework. Everyone has their own struggles. But when we hear of the achievements of two such impressive alumni, it really is uh, something that makes us realise that this is a good job to have. It's uh, full of rewards. Um, so it's great privilege for me to be here to introduce our two speakers. I'm going to say something about each of them. Uh, so first Rajan and then Mamuna, so that then when they come to do their talks, we can just get on with their talks without further ado. Uh, uh, so first of all, let me introduce Rajan. Rajan Woodruff uh, has won the prize uh, from the British Council because she is a director and a founding member of an NGO that works with some of the most marginalised communities in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. This is a project that she began over 10 years ago, uh, setting up, founding this NGO to work with people who were really, really excluded from everything that most of us take for granted. Uh, clean water, adequate sanitation, uh, basic education. Uh, and she will talk a lot more about the work that her NGO does. Um, prior to that, though, she had a very successful career in finance. And as we, as we were catching up earlier today, she was talking to some of our undergraduate students about this very successful career in finance, uh, reaching the peaks of chief economist in Merrill, Lee, in Merrill Lynch in South Africa and winning numerous prizes along the way. And she took a very brave decision to give that career up, to follow her passion and her soul to embark on a career in development and what a career it's been. Uh, she's won numerous prizes for the work that she's done with, with her NGO um, and she continues to win prizes uh, along the way. Um, Rajan uh, did the MSc in Development Economics in 2004-05 um, and I still remember teaching her during that year um, and I taught her poverty, inequality, rural development. And being an economist at that time, poverty was about dollar a day, definitions, and these sorts of things. But one of the things Rajan said to me this morning when she was talking to the undergrads, I hope I'm not stealing, stealing one of your lines, but she said, poverty is not being able to change the way your life is. And that resonates so much with all of us at Sussex because that's that inclusive understanding of poverty that we all, that we all believe in. 
So Rajan will tell you a little bit, a, bit uh, a lot more about her work and the work that's led to winning her prize. Our second speaker, Mamanu Rahman, I didn't have the privilege to teach, unfortunately, although I have taught on, your, uh, on the MA Gender and Development uh, many years before you took, you took it. Mamanu has won the prize for an equally brave and pioneering decision that he took to tackle menstrual hygiene. This is a very much a taboo subject in many, many countries, even in you know, UK and Western, Northern developed countries. People don't talk about periods. People don't talk about menstrual hygiene product, products. Mamana took the decision that he was going to try and address this issue because he realized the consequences of not having adequate access to menstrual hygiene products meant for women and girls in his local community and the broader uh, country. Um, he will talk a lot more about his NGO, Ella Pads, um, and their goals to reach more and more women uh, in Bangladesh. Pamana also has a very successful career. He's been heavily involved with small and medium inter enterprises in Bangladesh, uh, uh, writing numerous reports, advising governments. Uh, he's worked for UNFPA, uh, looking at uh, clothing and textiles in Bangladesh. Uh, he's also worked for EU Bangladesh as well, uh, looking at SMEs and capacity development within SMEs. Um, and he's won prizes for this work and is recognised as someone that the government turns to for this advice. Um, I was told that Mamana was inspired by meeting Robert Chambers here at IDS. Um, and conversations with Robert Chambers about how to make a difference really impacted you and your path that you followed. Um, and I think it's, it's hearing stories like this that make us realise what a great place Sussex is. Sussex and IDS. When I say Sussex, I mean the two institutions. Um, and what a great legacy we are, we are leaving by handing on uh, to, our, to our former students. So I'd like to welcome Rajan to come to the stage um, and start her talk. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, so it's, it's really wonderful to be back here, um, having won this award. Um, because it was really here that um, I had the time to frame my thinking about what I wanted to do in development um, and to learn about what was, what, what was happening um, in best practice in development, what was happening in conversations around development on a, in a global environment. Um, and so Sussex really was the place that um, I started thinking about what I want to do and the contribution I want to make. Um, in 2004, 2005. So it really has um, a significant place uh, in my journey uh, to get to the point where um, I've now won this award. Um, I was asked to speak um, a little bit about why I chose the path. And as Julie said, um, I moved from a career in finance to a career in development and, and what brought me to that decision. Um, so this year, it's actually, it was exactly 10 years in the finance industry, and now it's been 10 years in development. So a 20-year career, um, half of which was really financial economics, and then the other half, development economics, and in the middle of that uh, was Sussex University. Um, so in order to, for me to talk about... Um, why I came to the decisions I have and why I've chosen this as the career that I hope I will have the privilege uh, to have for the rest of my life. Um, I have to talk a little bit about um, my personal background. Uh, so I was, uh, I was born in 1974 during the height of the apartheid uh, repression uh, in South Africa. Um, and uh, 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 during that time, um, we, uh, as I was growing up, um, we were uh, lived in, some of you might know, uh, one of the famous cases of, of forced removals, which is District 6. So my family come from District 6, uh, and we were forcibly removed from District 6 to what was called the Coloured Township uh, in South Africa for mixed-race people. Um, and um, 
I, I then grew up on the Cape Flats, which is this uh, uh, area, uh, Color Township, um, and uh, you know, and that and that formed a lot of um, of the person I then became. I got very involved in the um, the student movement in South Africa, the anti-apartheid student movement. Uh, I was chairperson of the Student Representative Council, and very much, uh, you know, in the streets, part of the band uh, Kosas, which is the band uh, student movement uh, under the ANC at the time. Uh, and that shaped a lot about a rot of the person um, that I was. Um, and I became very interested in understanding economics um, because the fight against apartheid was not just a fight against the political system, it was also the fight against what was the, the kind of economy uh, that we want to live under. So I was very, very interested in, um, in, 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 in those issues and then decided to go on to study economics at the University of Cape Town, uh, UCT. Um, and uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to, um, at the end of my undergraduate degree, uh, to be um, offered a, a, a position as the assistant economist at Merrill Lynch Investment Bank uh, in South Africa. And I thought, well, let's go make some money first. I was a poor student, um, so why not? And uh, I then started uh, doing that and, and got sucked into, into that career and into, into that lifestyle. And after about seven or eight years, I found myself very, very miserable. Um, and I thought back to when um, I felt I was inspired, when waking up in the morning, I was really excited about what I was doing about, um, and that was really during the student movement time, during, during the time when, um, uh, you know, when I was part of the anti-apartheid movement. And, and then I thought, well, what, should I do? You know, how should I think about what it is that my next steps would be? And I was lucky to be awarded a, a, a scholarship by the Ford Foundation, and I could study at any university in the world, and I could study any course. It was a very generous scholarship, and I chose to come to the University of Sussex because of the reputation it had, the combination between a very strong economic school, but also very strong on the development side. So that combination was, uh, it, it landed well with me. And, uh, and that's how I found myself here. Um, so during that time, 2004, 2005, I was really thinking about what I want to do next. And then um, I happened to meet um, the person who was to become my husband um, during that time. Uh, we had a long distance relationship where um, there was obviously no WhatsApp or any of that kind of Facebook. And I had to buy a calling card <laughs> and then call him from the call box. I don't even know if it's still there, the front of campus. Um, so he, had, he was also a business science student um, and he was starting to do this development project with the community uh, in Bulungula, uh, which is on the east coast of South Africa, very near where Nelson Mandela was born and grew up. Um, and uh, it is the poorest municipality uh, in South Africa. And in uh, the time that I was then traveling back and forth with this long distance relationship in between my studies, I started to get to know the community that he was building, doing his first project, which was the Bulungula Lodge, a backpackers lodge that he built in partnership with the community. And uh, in that time, that year, a third of the babies died of diarrhea from lack of access to clean drinking water. And my heart broke. And really, that's where the story comes from. It comes from that, that heartbreak and not being able to walk away from that, from that situation. So I'm going to show you um, a quick video, because I don't know how many of you have been to South Africa, but um, I want you to just get a little sense of the, um, of the visuals um, and of the area. And then I'll talk a little bit more after that. The area in which the Bulungula Incubator is uh, located is very near where Nelson Mandela was born. The area was called the Transkai, which was set aside as a black homeland under apartheid. As a result of that history, there was no government service of any kind. There was no education of any significance going on. There was no school, there was no clinic. Not a single person was employed in this area. So it was a very remote community, very poor, and with few opportunities to actually escape out of, out of poverty. The Bulungula Incubator is a rural development NGO. Its mission is to create sustainable, vibrant rural communities 
um, through partnering with the community as well as bringing in external uh, technologies and knowledge that can help people live much happier lives uh, without at the same time undermining local traditions and culture. Our four areas of focus we developed right at the beginning are education, health and nutrition, sustainable livelihoods and, and basic services which includes the water and sustainable energy use and integrated approach to, to development in the area. And nothing we do is without the, the consent and request of the community. widely accepted now there's been much research in the um, in the field of early childhood development which shows that the first 1,000 days of life have the biggest impact on um, learning ability on your um, earning potential on um, all your achievements throughout your life. Well, after seeing that we started the Jujurha Early Education Center. The age groups that we are working with is three to four four to five and five to six. When we applied a school readiness test to our five to six year old class, which is the grade R class, after three years of having been at our preschool, our children, the test at the level of children that have been to excellent pre-primary uh, schools, whether that's in Johannesburg or Cape Town or anywhere in the world. So it's a world class level of uh, preschool education. <laughs> This preschool created jobs to the community members. Most of the teachers are the people from the village. The parents are there, they are not paying school fees, they are involved in terms of cooking. In each and every day we've got two parents who are coming for cooking for their kids. After two years of that, preschool operating, the, the communities of the other three villages came to us and said we'd like to have this in our area and so we opened three more preschools uh, after that. Uh, in 2011 we did a survey um, where we found that 53% of households had lost at least one child to diarrhea. There were so many babies dying of diarrhea, what was the point of the preschool if we couldn't keep the children alive? We then you know, saw the need to, to start working on our, our water project uh, quite urgently. Uh, we did a lot of education around how water becomes contaminated, how to protect natural water springs. We raised funds for water rainwater tanks, so it's rainwater harvesting. Uh, also, we drilled four boreholes around uh, Ngeleni village. Since those interventions, the death of, of babies is unheard of. So, so that's, I think, a huge achievement um, in a community where more than half the households had lost a child uh, prior to, to those interventions. Our health programs then expanded from there when we began to run health days to encourage people to test themselves for HIV. We now have large numbers of people who are taking um, HIV treatment and again, the mortality from that has dropped dramatically. All this positive impact was directly related to the interventions made by Bulungula Incubator. It was nothing here in this village before Bulungula Incubator. Everything, it was difficult here. But now we see everything is easy because of Bulungula Incubator. Today is not me, not at all. It's 130 staff members of which 97%, 98% come from the local community. We run projects from health in pregnancy, early childhood development from zero to three, excellent preschool education. Uh, we do e-learning um, in mathematics and English for local government uh, uh, primary schools, which are the most under-resourced schools in our country. And then we have um, high school and vocational uh, college uh, that we built, and we do agricultural projects uh, for income generation and youth, uh, youth sports programs and, and art and cultural programs. So it's really preconception to career, 
and we are um, partnering um, with uh, national pilots in particular models of ours in which we've excelled. So our e-learning program is now part of a national pilot to see if it would work in other areas, other um, both urban and rural under-resourced uh, uh, schools in the country. Uh, we've collaborated with the government on policy documents in early childhood development. So we're starting to have a broader impact, um, but at the same time, doing that, making sure we do that with partnerships and with government. Um, and other organizations and continue to be focused on our on the ground work, our grassroots level work, because that really is where most of the need uh, in, in, in poverty alleviation lies. There are a lot of good people in the big cities in the world working on the policy level work. We need the skills of people on the ground at the grassroots level to help make a real impact. Thank you. No, it's in it's in this deck, I think. Of course, I should know a quicker way of jumping into the slide. Here we are. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, University of Sussex and IDS, of course. And it's a huge honor for me to share my experiences with you my respected teachers, mentors, students, and development professionals. I want to share this honor with my people back in my country who were suffering a lot with this stigma that you have already heard about it. I want to share this honor with the workers in the garments factories who are working for the ELA project and come up as a challenge for their management and develop a cases for the country, for the world, for the sectors. I want to share this honor, particularly with my elder sister who is right now suffering with UTI for long, who couldn't complete her education, who was dropped out from these schools. I wanna share this honor with my fellow colleagues and they are alumni ideas who were actually giving me feedback to develop these LAPAD projects. The mission of this LAPAD project is women's health and well-being. And I will share the how the Sussex University and the ideas transform my thinking and how transform we our society. The simple cases that I am going to share with you, how the life of this worker in the left side, uh, you see the Suratun as a worker, a garments worker, how she transformed her life from worker to entrepreneur. It's a very simple, but she did it. And she's making the locust sanitary napkin. She learned it from the factories to know it. And now she is uh, working for others, for our community people. Please stay with a couple of minutes, and exactly 12 minutes, I'll finish. <laughs> yes, the, how the ELA, ELA is working. This is a low-cost sanitary napkin that is made by reusing the garments and textile scrap. And it's led by women and for the women. You know that in, in, in our country, Bangladesh, we have a uh, uh, over 5,000 garments factories and 4 million workers, mostly women, are engaged in these sectors and serving you. Uh, um, we are second in the largest, largest, of course. 
So how ELA is working inside the garments factories, in the textile factories. So we are going to the factories and teaching the workers how it make it, how they can solve it, their own problem. And once they are learning it, they are setting their own enterprise outside the factories. And they are uh, setting their own enterprises, as I mentioned. So ELA started with a target of the 5,000 factories and 4 million workers, and mostly women. And right now, we have uh, yeah, um, uh, C is a society of ELA Alliance we formed with these entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs. And our target is to create 1,000 entrepreneurs like the Suratun, as you have seen. So what we are doing, we are creating the awareness inside the factories. Uh, in, the, in our uh, country, we are going to the factories and motivating the workers, the management, to take the initiatives um, to solve their own problems. You know that we have abundant uh, scarves uh, that is available, that is left over uh, by the factories. And we are also going to the schools and uh, motivating the schools management to teach the topic. This, is, this subject is not taught in the school as well. Uh, this is the, because of this taboo. So we are not only ensuring the product from the supply side, we are creating the demands. So our, and at the same time, we are connecting the, our entrepreneurs like Soratun with the schools. And these are the girls who are uh, very vulnerable and they have a, we'll show you how they are getting dropped out to the schools later. So ELA is focusing on society, economic, and environmental. All the, all the aspects we are trying to focus. And of course, we are addressing the people, planet, and profit you know. That's how we are addressing all the SDG goals. One to 70s goal are targeted by our one process. So you might have questions. Please feel free to ask any particular questions how it is related to ELA. So I, earlier I was working with the ministry. We are addressing particular goals. So I am telling that our ELA is addressing all these goals. You know, you are expert and how he's doing. So we can explain later. So what is the challenges actually that the, we are facing and how the, our, my ideas degree helped me to, to, to face these challenges and design this product, product to solve the problem. So challenges is that you know, very shocking, taboo things. Please go through that. It's a very striking. How these girls of ninth grade died in the classroom. She became fainted in the classroom. Because of the taboo things, she couldn't share with her friends. Do you know the reason? She was using a dirty rags. And once she was taken to the hospital and during the postmortem, it was she was identified that there are two poisonous worms in her uterus. It's an extreme example, but this has happened, and it was covered by our major media in Bangladesh. This is the shocking, shocking saga that encouraged me again and strengthened me to come forward and with without the solution. So like these ninth grade girls, we have a 10 million school girls is more or less facing this same problem. 40% of these girls are getting dropped out of the schools because of reasons of these not having access to sanitary napkin. That is the statistics of the World Bank, ADB, and many in the SNB, many organizations done. So this is the challenge. Our challenge is that the garments worker, that you, you know that, four million garments workers, where I am working, uh, and I find out that in these modern ages, these workers are working in the nice factories. They have a toilet, but they can hardly get access to these toilets. So because of tight, very tight conditions, they have to work in the supply chain. You know that the first fashion, how they are managing uh, in, in the end. So I am arguing with the with the factory owners, with the brands. Yesterday, I met with the brands in the UK. And funny thing is that they are not owning. This is not our factory. They are not our workers. 
you see this is the way the brands are treating our, our beloved sister over there. The shocking saga. Another thing is that the garments scrap that are being left over, that, that is being thrown away and burned in the streets, yeah, and the brick field and causing a lot of pollution and sometimes floods. Another incident, you know, the Rana Plaza, it happened, and how the modern slavery is treating our workers over there. Our, our owner over there, they are not, they are not reach that pass, but the, what the brand is doing, what's their responsibility? They are not taking any responsibility of these workers. Over 1,000 workers killed by the Rana Plaza, and none, none of the brand are taking the responsibility. So this is the huge challenge for our, our factory owners, small factory owners, of course, over there. So uh, to ensure the health, the hygiene, and this issue. There's, these are the all uh, uh, challenges that we are facing in our uh, country back, and the lessons from the Sussex, and how we can address these challenges. All of these are interrelated, and our, to me, me, the solution is that access to sanitary napkin can ensure access to education, can ensure uh, uh, better productivity of the textile industry. In my is study, I have, we have seen that the, the sector is losing 1,600 million hours, 1,600 million hours every year, just not having sanitary napkin. Imagine how big it is. It's a silent tsunami. Uh, this is the statistics of um, uh, um, academic people across the world. They are acknowledging this is happening. So ensuring the napkin, we can ensure our solution that is interrelated. Uh, so how the idea uh, came up in my mind, that's the question maybe you have asked that in this classroom, uh, I, of, of course it was behind the CLTS that, you know, the community led total sanitation. That is your, I, I'm sure that you are familiar in, in the Sussex, this Robert Chambara, I, I lucky to meet again today. Uh, it has, um, uh, to be honest that, once I came here in, the, in, the, uh, in Brighton, it's a one-way ticket. I don't have any plan to go back to my country. Yeah, and the, yeah, my, my dream of being in UK, uh, professional life, was destroyed by the CLTS com concept and the Robert Chamber. <laughs> and, and I must salute now. Yes, I now. Immediately, immediately I feel I, in the, all the classes being participating here, uh, all the subjects uh, I taught it, it, all about Bangladesh. That's the things I was talking in the, in the morning. So I immediately felt urged to go back to my country and to do something for my society. Uh, yeah, you know, all these things have, uh, is came up. So how the LI story is actually right now impacting on the policy makers, how I did it. And the, over the years, almost over one decade, we are working in different form. So uh, uh, our, our, uh, our sanitary pad makers are now how influencing the policy makers. This is now in the polit last election time, this topic was placed to the political, leading political parties. Uh, to, it was covered by the media uh, to include it. And recently you have seen that the taxes on the sanitary napkin was cut by the government, thanks to that. But still, the, uh, uh, we have to do for uh, small industries. Uh, we are also working for, with the Department <laughs> Ministry of Industry and the SMEs. And they have, uh, in the current SME policies, they included ELA as a model. That, could, that can solve the problem of large industry with the small industry to reuse the scrap. You know, this is a part of the circular economy that, that we are arguing with the government that we can rebrand the Bangladesh. Rebrand the Bangladesh is a new way, not Rana Plaza. We, are, we have a good example of reusing, recycling, and green industries and uh, green product. That's what we, are, we are, are doing, and it is being uh, already uh, uh, acknowledged, and we want to move it further. So before finishing in time, I have one and a half minutes left. <laughs> I, 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 yes, I want to share the story that I started, the cases, how our workers are being transforming their lives, creating the green products. Please.
আমার নাম সুরাতন বেগম আমি গার্মিসে চাকরি করতাম গার্মিসে চাকরি করার সাথে জাকির ভাইয়ের সাথে পরিচয় হয়েছে জাকির ভাই থেকে শুনছি শুনে না এলাপ্যাট ব্যবহার করছি ব্যবহার করার পর তাই আমার কাছে ভালো লাগছে তাই আমি ওটা বানাচ্ছি এলাপ্যাট অনেক ভালো স্বাস্থ্যের জন্য দাম অনেক কম Ella is moving with a mission to create 1,000 small green entrepreneurs who will create 1 million green jobs to appease the impact of climate change. Ella is developing to achieve the goal. Suratun Begum is from one of first batches of entrepreneurs. She is making low-cost healthy sanitary napkins to spread among the deprived working women and vulnerable schoolgirls to ensure safe periods. She is now self-reliant selling pads. interconnection between all the different dimensions of deprivation and poverty and the need <coughs> to address not just one thing but to tackle mm. the whole cycle. So both of you talked about the connections between education, health, work, employment, business, health, education and, and so the interventions, the projects that you're both running mm. have that whole view about what we are trying to achieve in international development. I think the second thing is about the importance of partnership. Mm. You've, you've both demonstrated the importance of working with local people, local communities, local organisations, mm -hmm. private sector organisations, uh, local government, um, and I can only guess at the challenges uh, that you've both faced along the way. So thank you both very much for those talks. Um, please. Hands up, there are some roving microphones uh, around the room. I'm going to take a round of questions first. Um, so I can see uh, two hands up in that area of the room, and then I think you were, you were next at the front. Uh, is it on? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Georgie MA Gov. Thank you very much for a brilliant talk. I wondered whether you could elaborate, both of you, uh, slightly on how you got funding at the start to do this. I think that would be really interesting, and any challenges around that. Um, actually, my question is very related. It's not just about the funding in the first place. It's more about the business model itself or the sustainability of the model. Um, since from both of you we've heard that um, like the target group or the beneficiaries are not employed in traditional manners, so I'd love to know more about the, their methods of engagement with your organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you, it's a great question. And um, at the front here, and then I'll take another round, so if you want to catch my eye, one here. Hello. Uh, Stefan Manning from the strategy department. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot for this presentation. I have one question for both of you, which is how do you approach the scaling question or the scaling problem? Mm. Uh, have you thought about, for example, a franchise system, which I know from other social incubators, they just, um, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? Or partnering with another organization to scale up production? Mm -hmm. So I don't know who wants to say that you yeah, I can talk about the partnership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you regarding the partnership issues, and I would say that uh, um, yes, it took time to set the example. Uh, you know this over a decade almost, but recently and more very recently after uh, this awarding last year, almost one year, it was declared. So many partnership opportunities we are coming. 
uh, yes, particularly the, all, the, all the major development actor is approaching me. It's a, it's a very learning for the youth development students. Where earlier I'm looking for the jobs, these organizations, they denied me, but they are offering me the, to create partner with ELA. This is very interesting. So all major development with the UN organizations, with the, uh, all the uh, European Union, and they are, they are approaching us to do partnership. This is a development actors. And of course, in, in the government, government sectors, the right now, the prime minister office is approach us to replicate this model at the country level. So, uh, and, uh, so this is the way from the public, private, and NGO. And the major NGO is approaching us to work with us. So partnership is a very, and of course this is a sustainable in that context. So we hope that in the uh, uh, next two years, uh, we, can, we, can, we can show you more result of partnership of this. And of course it would be, we are also discussing in the regional level. So from Bangladesh, we are replicating in the, our uh, Vietnam, Laos, and uh, Indonesia, so where they are textile based. So partnership is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very, uh, yeah, we are getting response from the partners. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing, yeah. I think I should. Rajan, do you want to, so, the, so there's some overlaps in those questions sure. about funding, business models, and then how, you know, how do you make this a sustainable enterprise that you can scale up to, to reach not just your community? Sure. Maybe you could speak to that. And then okay. We'll take another round Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, funding. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, well, we, when we started, um, I mean, the problem with funding is uh, it's, uh, it's, if you don't have a track record, where do you start? Um, so, of course, we started off with that problem. Um, and we used some of our own money to start. Um, there wasn't a lot of money. Um, uh, just, to, just to start something small and to do one thing and then to build up the track record from there. So, so you, you have to take your time to build some kind of track record, and even in whatever it is you want to do, if I'm talking about grassroots work now, if, you want, if you're wanting to help one person, um, you, know, uh, you know, whether it's just you know, mentoring a child, or even just if you were to do sanitary pads, for example, and you just did a few of them, uh, and, and, and you, put, you got some family money together, some friends, you know, we did. In fact, we um, sent out a, an appeal at the time, which now would be called crowdsourcing, but in 2004, it was just called an email to everybody um, <laughs> and asked anybody who had ever come to the area, to the Bulungula Lodge, uh, could you please give us some money? Uh, you've been to the area, you've met the community, to give us some money to start something. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, 10 pounds here, 5 pounds there, you know, we, we gathered together um, a little bit of money. Um, which, yeah, I mean, I think it was something like, you know, it was a thousand pounds and it was two thousand pounds. And then you start to build that track record and, and build on from that. Um, I did, I was able to draw on contacts in the finance industry, um, so that helped as well. Um, and I was able to go to, to people that had access to funds. Um, so that was the beginning, and that's always the, the hurdle. Once you cross that hurdle and you develop a track record and you've done something, people are then prepared to give you more money to do the next thing, and then you continue to build. Um, the stage that we're in now is we are getting more and more support from government, uh, which, is, which is where the sustainability question comes in. Uh, we are not trying to replace government at all. We're wanting to develop partnerships with government and enable government to do what it should what, it, what, it, what, it, what its role is in society. So in a properly functioning society, you tax people who can pay taxes and you use that money to help the people who need the resources. Um, but that doesn't work properly all the time, and it's certainly in South Africa, given South Africa's history and background and legacy, we've still got a lot of work to do there. So if we spill the preschool, for example, with money from Deutsche Bank or some foundation, uh, they might build the buildings, um, train the teachers, buy the resources, and then there'll be government money for early childhood development, but the local government processes are, are broken, and you need to make the connection between the community capacitate the community to do it themselves. So every project we do as a community committee, which could be made up of parents in 
the preschool or, um, you know, uh, concerned citizens or every single project, whether it's a water project, a high school project, agriculture, will have a community committee. And they will then um, be trained and be given the capacity to run that project by themselves and then make the connections with government in order to get the funding for that project. Um, South Africa is different to Bangladesh is that we're not the poorest country in Africa by any means, but we are one of the, well, well, we are the most unequal. So we have wealthy people and we have money in the country, but we also have the poorest people that have as you know challenges that are as big as anywhere else in Africa. So it's trying to, 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 to make those linkages and to bring them together. In a country like Bangladesh, it might be that it's outside money that you're wanting to bring in. In South Africa, there's a lot of internal money that we can access. Um, but it's, but it's, uh, you know, it's trying to create those linkages and then we've, we then spin the projects out into independence. So we never want to be doing a particular project forever. It might be that it's six months to being spun out, which might be an income-producing project, like a, a farmer who now is, has um, her own business. That could be six months to being spun out. A preschool could be three years. The Bulungo Lodge was 10 years to, to being on its own. Um, but we always have a path to, to sustainability and to being spun out. On the scaling side... Um, yeah, scaling's tough, um, and also to make sure that you, you scale with the same quality that you, that you start at. And um, a problem that I'm, that I'm trying to get some, well, conversations I'm trying to get some traction with, with uh, national foundations and organizations is that when you talk about an idea in business, the person who comes up with the idea wants to be the person who scales it. With us, it's different. We don't want to own that idea. If we have a really good program or model that works, whether it's for, for e-learning or for setting up an agricultural business, we want that to be, we, it's, we want it to be, op well, it is open source. We make it open source. And we would love somebody to take that very good idea and that model and replicate it somewhere else so that we are not the replicator because we want to be the incubator. I mean, the, being on the ground and be working in a community where it would be quite hard for somebody without the relationships that we have with the community to come in and try anything. We have an enormous amount of credibility and the community is us. I mean, it's made up of people in the community. So allowing us to be the incubator is what we do best and then get somebody else to be the replicator and to be the scaler. And I think in development, that idea that the, that the, the, the scaler doesn't have to be the person who came up with the idea is, is, is something that, that people don't really get because they want us to scale and we don't want to scale because then we can't do what we do best. Yeah. Thank you, that's a great answer. Um, I'm going to take another round of questions. I know there was a hand up uh, here at the front. Are there, and, there's, and then you'll be second, I'm trying to say, and, there's an, and then a third, third or, and maybe fourth question, you two. Thank you. Thank you very much, first speaker. <laughs> You gave uh, a long, 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 long answer to my question. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. But let me just focus on one part of the story which I didn't hear you relate to very much, which is how much of school fees come from families themselves and in what circumstances are required for a family to be able to move from no fee pay uh, to being able to pay fees. Sure. Thank you. Good question. Uh, so James, just uh, on the end of the road. Uh, thank you so much for your comprehensive uh, description for what you have done. Um, actually, I come from a background who um, I was a livelihoods mentor for uh, beneficiaries with vulnerable status. Uh, to uh, assist them in starting their own uh, businesses and to be uh, uh, future entrepreneurs. But we were all stuck that between the two pillars of empowerment and vulnerability. So um, in many cases, uh, the level of vulnerability of people uh, who we were um, in potentially intentioning that they will be uh, future entrepreneurs, like act as a challenge to, 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 to be a uh, to empower them or to assist them with, the, with, the, with their businesses. So was there a criteria in your selection to, to, to select the beneficiaries or the people who will be able to, to, to start their own business or to work uh, at your projects? Um, so if, it, if, it, if it, the, vulnerability, the vulnerability could be a, 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 like acting as a challenge, not uh, a push uh, forward. So I was just okay. talking about this. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think I'm going to ask our speakers to answer those two questions first, as we only have five minutes left in the room. Um, if there's time, I'll take I'll take some more questions. But of course, we are we will be having a drinks reception at the end of this, so there will be time for people to carry on uh, the discussion. So, on the very specific question about school fees and the burden that places on families, I don't know, Rajan, do you okay. want to talk about that? And then Mamuna talk about that broader issue about empowerment and vulnerability. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, the school fees. Uh, so we uh, we have. But we have both. So we started off with preschools, uh, and now we have a high school and a college that we built. And both of them would have a fees model. The first preschool we built was in 2009, and uh, the community were not able to to make a financial contribution. Um, uh, most, if anybody had any income, they were living on a child grant, which is about ten pounds a month. I'd say that's the amount of money that the household lives on. Um, so what we did was we then, um, with the community, worked out what the contribution uh, could be. And we've had an amazing amount of contribution to all our work from the community. On a regular basis, every uh, household that has a child in the preschool has to volunteer one day to cook or to work at the preschool. Um, and initially, it was... You know, some people wouldn't come, and you know, and and then others would come, and but now it's become the norm. So, uh, so you have one household uh, volunteering in uh, a member of the household volunteering in the preschool at least once a month, and there's a roster for that, um, and the community makes sure that that everybody makes that contribution. It also brings the parents into the school, which was an additional benefit we didn't expect, and that's been really, really valuable both because it's the first time that anybody in the community has been part of an excellent educational institution and to understand what quality education is. So having the, the contribution from parents there has been enormous. But then all the buildings that we built for our preschools, for the Bulungula College, the agricultural <laughs> centre, um, the clinic, it's all land donated by the community. Um, so the, our community are they, the, the poorest community in the country, but it's on a communal land rights area. Um, so I can't imagine how long it would have taken us to, to do these projects if we had to buy land. So we haven't had to buy any land. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, all the, the community committees are volunteer work. Um, running of, of those programs are done on a volunteer basis uh, by the community um, and running those programs. So the contribution is, is, is enormous. And then in the high school and the college, we have specific things where we'd say the parents would buy uh, the uniform, but we'll pay for the books. And so there's always, and with the scholarship children, well, there's always a list of things that the, the parents will provide and then a list that we will provide. So it's a, it really is a partnership. And the, the contributions both in volunteerism, in in, in in um, uh, uh, time and skills and labor, and then uh, in tangible ways, which is actual very valuable land. Um, so the contributions are very big. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, regarding the you know, the empowerment or agency of the women. Yeah, uh, yeah. As you have seen that the uh, the women who are used to get absent in the factories and the girls who are getting. Uh, couldn't attend in the schools and dropped out even solely from the school. So, so uh, 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 now getting access to the napkin, they are making it. They are uh, by themselves and they are talking, participating in the. They are getting the full time salary in the, in, within the factories and they are also participating in the uh, because as it is managed by them, so they are participating in the management. They are now part of the management where they are. Earlier, they are used to uh, remain shy, or they are not uh, ensured their participation. So they are raising their voice right, uh, right, right now. So you see, we can see uh, that the extreme example of empowerment is that right earlier, she was a worker. And right now, she's entrepreneur. And she is making this pad and supplying others, uh, fellow colleagues, and school girls. So extreme example of entrepreneur uh, empowerment, uh, we can say, the, the case of the Suratun that you have seen. 
So this is the way I uh, say that the empowerment issue is happening over there. Thank you. Okay, so, sorry, uh, Julie. There's just I think there was a second part to that question um, that I didn't answer. Which can you transition to a paid mo model if people want to do that? Mm -hmm. And that they because obviously you have people that are unemployed and that's why they're volunteering. So we do have a certain amount that you can pay for the school fees. And if you have a job, which many people now have in our projects, we have had people hire other people to do that day of volunteering as their contribution. And that's their business. Um, and, and so we do have a random amount. So there, could, there will be a transition over time. So as you get more jobs, as you earn money, you could say, OK, well, I earn money, more money in my job, and I can't take a day off. So you can transition into a paid model. That is a really nice insight, isn't it? Um, we have to wrap up now, so I'd like to thank all of you for coming today, all of those who are watching this uh, online, um, and a special thanks to our British Council Global Award winners. A round of applause, please.